Hey, hello everyone. We're live at TAPS. It's January 5th, 2016. Happy New Year to you all. I think this podcast will be released, I don't know, late January probably after we edit all the other ones. And you're looking at um, most of the student population at TAPS. Some of them I think are off practicing and uh, getting ready for the mock audition. That is what, tomorrow? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Um, so anyway, mock audition is one of the things we're going to do. We're going to go to a, a cricket match uh, tonight and we've had master classes every day. We've had group lessons every day. What else have we done? It has just been a really wonderful time at TAPS. This is my second TAPS and uh, we're in Adelaide, Australia. The first one was Long Beach, California. And of course TAPS stands for the Ted Atkatz Percussion Seminar. And I'm joined by Ted Atkatz right here, Mr. Tim Jones, and of course Laurel Black. So um, anyway, I would like to first ask one of the students, what has been one of your favorite things about TAPS? It's, it's just great to have, uh, well, especially coming from across the ditch in New Zealand, uh, coming out of where the percussion was really small, it's great to just have all these international artists and tutors just around, because we don't have anything like that over there. Yeah, that's, great. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Anyone else? Um, I'd say meeting Mr. Adcats. Um, that's been my least favorite thing, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad. Yeah, just, um, just getting just get, getting to know him and you know, from getting his opinion on you know his technique and excerpts has been really helpful. And as soon as I found out he was coming to Australia, I got pretty excited. And couldn't wait to put the taps. And, yeah. Cool. This podcast is going very well so far. Yeah, very well. Yeah, very well. We asked him to say all that, so. <laughs> what is the Ted Ag Cats? I would think, yeah, that would be uh, some of it. Um, so anyway, speaking of some of the, you know, some of the topics we talked about perhaps getting into at the faculty recital, you guys played a very cool duet that Ted wrote, and it's called Turnkey Hotel. It's not published yet. That's right. And I've heard it twice now, and I definitely liked it the first time. I liked it even better the second time. And one of the students, one of you guys asked something about publishing and I think particularly self-publishing. And Ted and I and Tim got into a really nice conversation about publishing. And um, I guess I'll just ask Ted the question, where does that piece sit with you as far as getting it published and getting it out there? And Because I, I hope you get it out there and I think people will play it. Um, it's, a, it's a cool piece. Well, thanks. It's uh, it was, it was a bit of an experiment as a composition because I really hadn't done a lot of writing for, for percussion. So um, didn't didn't exactly know how it was going to turn out, but um, Tim and I have been playing it. We've played, how many times have we played it now? So was that our fourth time playing? Fourth time, yeah. Yeah, and we're just, we're just starting to feel comfortable with it because it poses some challenges and uh, but I'm starting to get to a point where it feels feels comfortable and, and really fun to perform um, but we were we started talking about it because you're self-published Casey and, and you've got a lot more experience in this department than I do for right as of right now it feels a bit daunting to to deal with publishing but it's clear to me after talking to you that um, you know, I'm interested in, in uh, editing it and, and getting it published. Um, but it, it does it does seem like something that's that's a little daunting at the moment. I also think I've I've got to do some significant editing to it, as it was my first experience in, in working in in Sibelius writing percussion. Well, that's that's your first one. That's your first. That was first pretty one. good for your first. It's, this is a revised version. You did do some revisions because there were things that weren't that needed to be explained by the composer the first time that I played it, and then with the revised version. Version, it, it makes sense. Some of the things on the page speak for themselves a little better now. Oh yeah, the first version that you were looking at was like a whole another language altogether. It was like you know reading reading Greek or something, and and you figured out how to decipher it before I, I did another version of it. You didn't know about the time signature feature on the software. Uh, yeah, I mean I, <laughs> I thank you. Yeah, no, I barely that's, read that's music. A, that's I, so yeah, yeah, it was it was it was shocking to figure out that that these stuff could have a specific rhythm. We were just improvising. <laughs> <laughs> I, really, I really like the uh, electric guitar, yeah. the distorted guitar. Yeah, so for guitars, anyone who sweet. doesn't know Turnkey Hotel, which might be yeah, anyone who hasn't heard it live. I'd say that would be say? most people. Yeah, most what's people. the instrumentation? Yeah. Just so people know how cool it will be. When it's yeah, well, the, the, 
the opening of it is a, is a distorted uh, guitar with some percussion and, and sort of washy sound sort of establishes the kind of dark uh, a darkness to it um, but yeah let's see it, it's essentially two uh, multi percussion setups and Tim's setup you're able to stand up and play it although you, you use kick drum so, yeah. so we're both basically using kick drums so he stands to play my his part and I sit down and my, my part's more of a modified drum set but there's also a significant vibe part that comes in the B section that Tim plays and it, it's got a little bit of a sort of a fusion-y sort of element to it and then in the third section we sort of reintroduce the rhythms that that come about in the first part on mallet instruments so I move over to marimba and you're on vibraphone and then we reintroduce the rhythmic stuff that we had going in the first part there's this heavy groove throughout you've got this kind of quasi drum set and this ribbon crasher and this big china and I love that it's really polyrhythmic and the rhythms are very complicated but like we had talked about there's this kind of underlying groove and I have a complaint with a lot of new music and it seems like it's often in snare drum literature where it's just like a portion of a fivelet, portion of a seven, uh, triplet, and there's nothing to base that around. It's like, what's the point of going way off radar polyrhythmically if there's nothing if you that you're comparing anything. it to? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you have to compare it to something to even know that's what you're playing. Otherwise, you might as well just kind of be free-floating. Yeah. So I, re I really like that you know, you have this, this groove and then those things pop out. I actually think uh, um, Rebond's A does that very well because it starts with this like nice uh, yeah. click, doom, and you get this nice B, boom, and then it kind of grows from there and escalates to like really out there polyrhythms and it's like an example of that working. Yeah. So I and feel like yours does it and well, it's, I, yeah, it's, and it's I, hard I, to do. I think, that, I think that people generally, you know, every everyone takes some comfort in music that gives them a groove to latch on to. And I think that's like tried and true over centuries. And, and I think, you know, like the music of Steve Reich is a really great example of it. So I, I think that sort of minimalist thing was, was inspiring to me. That's why we have this pattern that just that builds up and is very repetitive but it gives you something to, to latch on to yeah. and I agree that was something that was a goal for me in writing the piece was I didn't want this true you know strictly esoteric type of piece in which people are, are, are longing for something to, to grab onto and, and that's something that is is oftentimes I'm left after hearing a, a piece of new music for the first time going I don't get it and I, I wanted to do something that people could, you know, everyone could, could feel something. The, the, the complex groove that evolves, I like the beginning section of the piece because it starts off with this just big, heavy three feel, really yeah. slow three, and it, it slowly builds into what's going to become a complex groove. And both of those parts, both Ted's part and my part, stand independently mm -hmm. as grooves, but when you put them together, it fills all of the, all of the gaps, and it's not just more complicated, but you get the groove part that you were hearing, yeah. where there's the big beat are still accented through there so it's not complex for complex sake it actually yeah. glues the whole thing together and you know we're probably uh, not giving the piece enough credit because we're just saying groove and it is a groove but it's like a really esoteric groove like you look at the music and it's, it's, <laughs> it's very polyrhythmic but when you repeat that and you you give you release it at a pace that the audience can absorb yeah it becomes yeah. very groovy it know, becomes the very, new normal yeah because oh yeah that's awesome way to put it that becomes the new I love that you know yeah Laurel <laughs> uh, Black ladies LB. and gentlemen <laughs> so, so yeah anyway onto this you know like w what are your um, um, thoughts Tim has a very successful uh, history of rock and roll textbook right yeah yeah published by who Kendall Hunt okay and and this book so Tim's got major publisher I've got I have publishers but no one I've really utilized to my bulk of my catalog I've just got a few pieces so I'm I safe to say I'm primarily self-published and, and we talked a lot about the differences and I don't know um, wh wh where are you you're kind of thinking self-publish yeah well 
Yeah, to, to give everyone some, some background here to some of the things that we've been talking about this week in, in Casey's class, which happened, it's hard to keep track of the days. Was that, was that just yesterday? That was just yeah. yesterday. Yeah. Man, that's amazing. Um, yeah. It was just yesterday. Yeah, it, it was really interesting to, to talk to you, Casey, and hear you talk about self-publishing. And uh, I think this is something that's happening not only when it comes to the composition of, of music, but this is happening in in the in pop music and jazz music uh, for authors of books um, lots of people are now saying why why use a publisher in the in the in the age of internet and you have this ability if you have a, a blog if you have a website and you, the content of that blog or that website is strong or in the in the case of, of music I mean you're you're a great example of this Casey in that you created a YouTube channel at a time when people weren't really putting a whole bunch of uh, their own compositions of you know percussion yeah, sure. compositions on YouTube and you did it that Next thing you know, there's all these people. Um, I mean, I'm assuming that that m many of you had heard of Casey and seen some of his videos. Raise your hand if that's if that's true. Yeah. So the majority of you had had seen Casey online. So once you do that, now all of a sudden you've you've got this vehicle and you've got you've got people that that recognize you. And so now through that those videos, you said check out my website. So this is happening it, not only with with composition, but it's happening with people that are, well, that are writing music and performing music in, in the rock realm, self-releasing their records. Well, it seems like the issue is people seek out a publisher, assuming the publisher is going to do that work for them, and that just might not necessarily be the case. And I've had people tell me, well, if the publisher's not doing that for you, you just have a bad publisher. You need to have a good publisher. Mm. Um, so my view on it is kind of like, eh, I don't feel that great about Publishers, but you have real positive regard for your publisher. Yeah, you, I mean, your book is—you said two thousand copies at UNLV alone, right? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and some other places. But yeah. they, even though they're a major publishing house, they're they're a private company, and so they give you a lot of latitude as an author into as to what you can do and the, the assistance that they can give you with getting rights to things like images and uh, and getting a good copy editor that will work with you within the style that you want to write and yeah. and get things out there. How did you how did you get it? I guess the basic question, how did you get it published? Because you hear about people all the time, I'm pitching this to a publisher, mm -hmm. I'm pitching that to a publisher, and they just the publishers don't bite. Uh, what was it uh, about your book or what was it about the process that, that you did write? Well I didn't write the book before they asked to get a book. Okay, they asked and for it first. They had some vision because you know, all of the publishing companies have people that go out there and they're, they're trying to get you a, to adopt their textbook because that's how they make sales. So, right. you know, would you look at this? Here's a preview copy. Would you consider this for your class? And they want people to adopt their text. That pisses me off. So I get that phone call. <coughs> Hi, this is so and so from, from yeah from yeah. McGraw Hill, and I see you yeah. teach music history. And what text are you using over there? And I just want to be like, go to hell and. <laughs> I mean, really, they just, they're just they relentless. I, mean, well, it's I don't mind it so much because I get to see what else is out there, but it does bother me when they haven't done their homework and they ask an author with another company, would you consider adopting this book? Like, Do you realize that I wrote the, the competition to the book you're promoting to me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's yeah. interesting. But I got so many of these requests of, you know, would you look at this, would you look at this, from all kinds of publishers. And Kendall Hunt listened because I, I finally said, you know, the problem with this book is that the, the History of Rock is a 600-page book, and I have a 15-week semester. We can use about 20 to 25 percent of the book. The mm -hmm. bookstore wants to charge $200 for this thing because it's a university text, and the students basically are getting ripped off. Yeah. They said, "Well, what's the solution?" They "Well, I I just want to use the components. Can I just take this component? Well, we can't separate that. It's a you know, but you could write your own." Yeah. I said, Okay. So would you be serious about writing your own book? Said, Absolutely. And so we sat down and we mapped it out and what the possibilities would be and what the cost would be of getting rights and permissions to get all of the stuff that I wanted in there. And so we came up with this model and it took about six to eight months to write the text and we got everything there. The book was down to about 200 pages on the first edition and we use 100% of the book every semester. Cool. Um, and well, for the bookstore, it was about 
25% less than yeah. all of the other they textbooks. They wanted that were out a $200 there. history of rock and roll textbook. The bookstore did. Right, but it's a, it turned out to be a $50 book that we put out there. Yeah, so. success. Well, that, that drove us nuts, nuts teaching music appreciation. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't want to use the whole book. We didn't want to use the whole CD set. I mean, I just did not feel like the introduction to classical music should be uh, a little night music by Mozart. It it's like, no, it should be like, no, it should be like Shostakovich scherzo. It should be like something freaking cool. Um, you know, the yeah. last thing you want those students to think is like, oh crap, this is exactly what I was worried it would be. It's like right. stuffy, Hedwig, dorky classical music. Yep. It's like, no, let's show them something really, really, stuffy really cool. Hedwig. Yeah. Stuffy Hedwig. <laughs> yeah. But it's overwhelming too when they get 600 pages of stuff and and it's just too much. It's, it's too an much. appreciation class. Yeah. It's a stepping stone. I call my book an appetizer yeah. into popular music. That We don't cover everything. Yeah. We can't possibly cover everything. So here's some things that I think are particularly important to the evolution of this style and some bands and artists that I think you should know about within rock and roll. Well, and it's, history from of, there. it's history of rock and roll. It's not a medical textbook. I mean, it's, you know, it should... Anyway, hey, speaking of yeah. rock and roll, um, this is something, a little news item we reported on, I guess, last episode, mm -hmm. but I would love to hear you guys talk about it. Uh, the Beatles, you guys ever heard of this band? <laughs> the Beatles. Um, yeah, right. So um, th I guess they, uh, on Christmas Eve, they went, uh, put their whole catalog available streaming. So it's been on iTunes now for a while, available download, and uh, there's a quote from uh, someone there in the ABC News or New York Times, I forget, saying that this is the last breath of the CD uh, era, the physical you know, mm. uh, era. I thought that was really interesting, and I don't know if I necessarily agree with that, but I don't know, what do you, what do you guys think about that, and especially with Nyko recordings? Um, yeah, I thought, it was, I thought it was really interesting that, that for so long, the, the Beatles trust, you know, basically said, "No, we're not going to play this game." Mm -hmm. So, so, and, and by this, so, so my yeah, experience, they held out. They held out yeah. and said, and so, I, I think what's happened, it's it's very clear that people are not interested in, in the old model of paying, uh, you know, thirteen or fourteen dollars U.S. And I don't know what CDs went for in Australia, but I don't think if we ask, poll some of the younger people in here. Um, do, do you guys ever buy CDs? There's one person, two people, a couple. Okay. Okay. Well, then, then maybe maybe I'm wrong about this, but this happened to me. At a, I was I was working with uh, the the band was playing with a student orchestra in about 2008, and one of the bass players who was about 16 years old came up to me and said, "I really love your music. Where can I get it?" I said, "Well, you can buy our CDs on on our website." And he said, uh, well, "I don't pay for music." And at the time, <laughs> and at, at the time. I I was, I was really offended. I mean, I said, how could you not consider paying for, for music that you like? Because I grew up, you know, one of the most fun things to do was go to Tower Records in New York yeah, City yeah. and peruse through uh, all these CDs. And, you know, the store was three levels and, and it was just yeah. the most fun thing. And you actually spent your allowance, you know, on the, the new bands mm -hmm. that you were interested in. Um, and so at the time when he said this, I was, I was offended and it really made me, it made my head spin. How could you not want to do this? And uh, then I, you know, over that the last, you know, eight years, I, I've been lear learning about Spotify and, and what, when you put your music on Spotify, what it pays, and it pays pennies on the dollar. I mean, it pays mm -hmm. essentially nothing. Essentially nothing. And, yeah. and so the model has now become, if you're an unknown artist or, or a fledgling band, you release your music on YouTube and you put it on Spotify and uh, you're essentially giving it away. And they, people say, well, you'll make your money touring. Well, that's true if you know you've got a fan base of, you know, three hundred thousand people, and every city you go to, you've got five hundred to a thousand to five thousand people coming. But if you know, we used to make lots of money selling our CDs, and then we went from there to making very little. But now more people are listening to our music than ever before. Mm -hmm. So I guess we're supposed to be happy about that, right. even though we're making ver less money. It seems like it's great for getting out there, getting your name out there, getting visibility. It's not good for making money. Yeah. I, love, I love you said the Tower Records story because I remember my, my equivalent to that was growing up in Logan, Utah. We had this little shop called Graywell CD Exchange, and it was a used swap CD shop. It was awesome because you did have your you know your allowance or the money you made mowing the lawn, and the used CD was 
seven bucks. The new CD was fifteen bucks, mm -hmm. and you had uh, you know eight bucks in your pocket, and I, you would spend so long listening because you're like, hey, I can only buy one. So you listen to so many different things. You like red liner notes. You're like, I got to choose one. Which one is it going to yeah. be? And it made you listen really hard and like invest time in what you were going to pay for. Whereas now, it's just like, oh, Spotify. I'll just, I'll just take it all and listen to it when I want to. Which is, I don't know. Yeah, I, I miss the the yeah, old and thing. I, it, and I think it, it I think it really kind of devalues. I mean, I, I yeah, I remember. Uh, I'm, too I'm, easy. I'm dating myself, but you know, for me, it was vinyl, and you got your record. And I remember my first record; it was a it was a Billy Joel record, and uh, you know, you you take out the the, the liner notes, and you you look at all the pictures, and you you basically had to sit there. You didn't have to, but you typically would sit there and listen to side A, and you wouldn't do anything else except look at the pictures and look at the lyrics, and you were focused on that. And so, yeah. technology now is is great. You can you can be walking down the street and 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 checking out Spotify, and you can be on the treadmill, and you can be doing five different things. But I think it devalues some of the, you know the essence of music, which is music is really great when you take the time and make that your primary focus. And that's why the live the live performances I don't think will ever die because people still love to focus all their energy on viewing and listening to music. Yeah, when I taught music at Preach, my first like week and a half of the course was talking about listening and active listening versus passive listening and which I said active listening actually means that you are doing nothing else. Right. It's going to feel like you're doing nothing because you're just sitting and you're just listening. And That's the students, what the students doing. are going, okay, yeah, yeah I hear and, what you're saying. And they're just <laughs> right. like, yeah, so, yeah. um, but yeah, just a little tangential story. So I was, this was maybe, I don't know, a year or two ago, and I was a church musician and you know, lots of families and lots of people that wanted piano lessons and I didn't have a lot of time to give to that. And so I limited it to older students that could already kind of play because I wanted to like enjoy the entire process. And I remember talking to this one high school guy that uh, said, well, do you teach lessons? I said, yeah, yeah, are you interested? He said, yeah, I would be. I said, okay, well, here's what I do. I always do the first lesson for free so we can see if it's a good fit. And, the, you know, then after that, um, you know, we'll talk about the rate and whatever. And that will kick in. And he goes, well, didn't you say that you kind of taught yourself how to play? I said, well, yeah, when I was like 10. But, yeah, then I had lots of teachers. And, and he just said, well, I think, I think people should always teach music for free. They should always teach for free. Like, if you're able to learn it by yourself, why should I ever pay to... You know, to learn it, and the, the the kid's mom was standing right behind her, and she was just mortified. Just had this look on her face, like, "Oh my god!" Yeah. You know, and and she tried to explain, like, "That's," she said, "We don't actually think that." You, yeah. And he was yeah. you know, he was a spewing. It was crikey. crikey. Yeah. You said crikey. Yeah. That but means it's just, that you means that means <laughs> that, that means he was he was very unhappy and <laughs> very and, unhappy. And, and agitated. Yeah, but it's just interesting, and I, I wonder if some of that comes from now. It's so easy to get so much music for free. Do they start to think that then everything about music should be? But people free, also think or? it's like a it's a hobby. You know, the same it's the the same line of thinking that you know you have the parent that says, "Wait, you can major in music? Really? Right? That's a mm -hmm. that's a yeah. Year. How are you going to make? I don't want to pay. Money? I don't yeah, want to yeah. pay for music, but I'll pay for a comic book. I'll pay hundred dollars to go to Comic Con. In yeah. Boston, and dress up like a stormtrooper. You know that I'll yeah. pay for, but I won't pay for your Take hours of this. expertise. And yeah. yeah. Anyway, soapbox. Yeah. Give it a burl. But I, I, I think <laughs> it's gone walkabout. It's gone walkabout. He's gone yeah. walkabout. <laughs> yeah. She looked like a, like a, like a stunned mullet. What does that mean? <laughs> You're in shock. Hey, I, I want to know where were you guys on the and anybody else too? Where were you guys on the whole Napster thing? Like when Napster hit, and actually I, it was so fun watching the development of that. I remember my friend John McGarry, guitar player in my like you know childhood garage band, um, s 
smart technology computer programmer now, uh, just smart as hell, always on the front of everything. I remember when MP3s existed, uh, when they like, it, you could get a CD ripper, and he was just asking for all our CDs. He just said like, guys, give me, just bring your CDs yeah. in stacks, and he was just ripping them, and we had no idea what he was doing, and we just thought, I mean, I understand. He's like, no, this is great. Look, you can fit 10 CDs in the space of one on your computer. That's awesome, and we just did not understand. We were like, but so what? Like, why? You can still just play the CD, and and now it's evolved into this thing. So, so where, where were you guys on the the big Napster news when it became controversial? Were you a downloader for free, or were you, a, oh, this is wrong, we shouldn't be doing this? I, I don't know that I had an opinion one way or the other to yeah. begin with, because when did music become so expensive and the record companies sort of putting this dollar value mm -hmm. where the money really wasn't going back to the artists in the way that it was coming into the companies. And yeah. So if you go back to the 30s and 40s when people were paying to go into a venue and see something or music was coming over the radio and they listened to it, no one was going to their house and saying, we well, you owe us five dollars for this week's radio service. Right. Um, there was a dollar value on on things, but it, it took a long time to figure out that what these artists had was actually a marketable, packageable product yeah. that they could put out there and, and people would pay a lot of money for it. Um, I think that it in a way devalued the quality of the art and put the emphasis on the publishing and promotion and then it yeah. became who's promotable as opposed to who's got the most talent sure. and what sort of music is making it to the market wasn't always the best quality music. It was what would sell the fastest and for the most money. Well, that's how I feel about publishing too. Yeah. You know, that that's something I said really cynical in my master class. <laughs> you know, it's I don't know if they care if it's good or not. I think they only care if it's gonna sell. And often sell. usually good material sells, but depends. Well Napster know. was really I think looking back, the first crack in that model where all of a sudden like we don't have control over this entire industry. Now that there's this electronic media, it's the music is kind of, it kind of had to flow out there for free and even though artists suffered the companies suffered in a way too yeah. and trying to figure out how to control the music but it kind of opened the door for a new way of presenting music and for a lot of artists that meant that they actually took control of their music again yeah. so being able to self publish self record self release records and cut that middleman out and actually put the music out the way that you intended it to go out so it kind of shook everything up in a positive way. Seems like it. Did you guys see the South Park where they examine this and they they make fun of Lars Ulrich and and they you know they they go visit the house of Britney Spears and she's getting off her like Lear jet. It's like because of downloads she could only afford the the X1 model. She wanted the X2. The X1 doesn't even have a remote for its surround sound <laughs> DVD system. And they go to Lars Ulrich's house and it's like look at him. He wanted a gold plated uh, uh, swim up bar in his pool, but now because of media downloads, he's only able to get the silver-plated uh, swim-up bar, and he's all sad, and that's brilliant. Yeah, that's good. yeah. but you need that type of shake-up in order to open the doors to new possibilities and, yeah. and what's going on. So, yeah, artists suffered. The artists lost some of that, that money, but I think that they were going to lose that money anyway, because yeah. record companies weren't looking for ways to give you more money for the records that you sell. Hmm. So, you know, it, it, you kind of need a big shake up in order for things to change and then it gains traction again. I'll, I'll just say one thing slightly to, to uh, counterpoint against what you say. I think, I think we have a serious problem. It's, it's not just related to music, it's intellectual property. And I think we're, we have what's happening is a run on intellectual property that we're not valuing people's uniqueness and, and their creative ideas enough and, and people feel that if it's online they have a right to it. I've got a friend who's um, created a digital type foundry so so mm -hmm. he basically figured out a, a type foundry used to be you know you, you had these pieces of metal like if you if you know what an old typewriter looks like you needed these little pieces of metal that you put ink on and, th and that went on the paper so your type foundry was actual the physical process of doing it mm -hmm. so he figured out well I can create 
create all these different fonts and all this, these different graphics digitally uh, at a time when it wasn't obvious that that was a way to go. Well, now he's constantly seeing advertising across the world, and this is his job. People are just stealing these fonts that he created. Mm -hmm. So it used to be that the model was people would always pay him for use of this font, you know, things things that he created, um, uh, you know, alphabet. Uh, and now he's just watching people steal all of his stuff. Uh, he's, he's slightly older, um, but this is pretty upsetting to him because it's changed his entire business model. He's, he's had to figure out other ways to, to make a living. And meanwhile, he was a super creative guy who came up with the idea of creating these fonts. So it's true in, in music, it's true in art. Um, and I, I think it's something, I, I don't know where, where, where it's going to end up, but I think you know, one of the things that's happening is it's tougher and tougher to make a living as a, as a creative, I, I believe. You know, let's say as a songwriter. There was a time in the 40s, you know, there's, there's uh, well, even before that, you know, talk about Tin Pan Alley in New York City. There was a whole area in New York City where there's all these guys in these little cubicles with pianos, and they'd write music and they'd sell their music. And so, you know, Burt Bacharach, you know, a generation later wrote all this music for other people and he wrote an article that was published a couple years ago about the death of the songwriter because people don't want to pay for it. So I'm not suggesting that you know we, we need to be rich to enjoy music, but I'm also thinking it'd be nice for people to get compensated for their artistry. Yeah, I agree. I, I think everyone should be compensated for their art. It should have a value. It's educating the public, I guess, that that what they get from the arts has a value and something that they should feel good about contributing to. If you're happy to buy a coffee every day for, for four or five dollars, and this the is the coffee good. here is quite good coffee. actually. I yeah. should mention bullocks. <laughs> crikey, crikey! <laughs> Rack off, would you? Rack off. Yeah, yeah we're you know, it's getting too serious. Would you Does be willing to spend four dollars on your on the right. on art every day if you're prepared to spend? Hey man, I don't pay for coffee. music. I don't pay for. I know you don't, but <laughs> it's gone. Walk about. <laughs> no, of course. I mean, you're, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Hey, I, I was going to ask. How do you think we should be advising students? So, as far as should should they go make a CD? Should they pour a lot of money into a CD? I have this conversation uh, with friends a lot. You mean if they're if they're writing their own music? Uh, or either way, or they're going to go record the. You know, they want to do a, another complete works of Keiko Abe double disc CDs recorded on marimba and. Uh, you know, should they should they just pour all that effort into making good quality YouTube videos, or should they go to a studio and invest and and punch a CD, um, and and should or should they give it to Spotify and give it to iTunes? And what do you guys think, man? I mean, it's hard because the really dust hasn't question. the dust hasn't settled on the issue yeah. yet. So it's it's yeah. I, I think what what I'm doing now with with music I'm writing with my band Nyko is is I'm just writing. You know, if if I come up with a single and we we write it and produce it and we've got a finished product, we we just we get it online so that it's on Spotify and you can download it. Uh, because I just I'm not sure that the model of the of the full length record is something that I think that we as artists it's important you know. To feel Feels good to, to have your final product be this, you know, 45 or 60 minute CD. But I'm not sure the public really cares enough about that and are willing to pay for for everything. They like your one little hit that you wrote, but are they really willing in this day and age to listen to the B side and, and listen to all the things that that didn't make the radio? So, uh, but I also think there, that one of the most rewarding things for me uh, was to have that full length CD and have that. That hard copy and say, I did this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's also a push back to vinyl now. Yeah. It's the same thing we're talking about with CDs that you got the liner notes and the CD was exactly the same thing that happened with the prior generation of we're getting rid of LPs and you're gonna go to this how can you possibly read all of this? You know, yeah. you're missing out. And then we go to the MP3. So there's actually a push of several friends that are in 
pretty successful bands release everything electronically and on LP. Yeah. And uh, are some of you guys in that area where your friends or maybe yourselves are starting to collect LPs, yeah. and there's a there's a level cool. of quality and a, an appreciation that's starting to emerge for the LP again, and it's with this generation. Yeah. And I think that's really cool that they're actually listening to the music in a in a high quality uh, version. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It sounds fantastic if you've ever heard like a really flat record, new <coughs> record on a really clean needle on a good system. It sounds, mm -hmm. it, it's, it does sound like you're listening it's to like an acoustic laying, instrument. Yeah, laying it down and being in the process of getting ready to listen to music and saying, yeah. "Here I am, I've got my record. I've got to be careful with it. You yeah. have to click it." Well, you know what I'm going to say. It, you know what? Yeah. Yeah. You play it and you're there. You're in the zone. Yeah, having a and physical copy is a pushback. That is also in Australia among younger bands a pushback to cassette tapes of all things oh, really? <laughs> for a different reason not because of sound quality I don't, I don't think yeah, it's, it's not such a great move maybe <laughs> because, because they can do it themselves and they it's a, it's a retro thing you, you make your first tape then you copy a tape and you, it degenerates and they chuck them out to their friends they've forgotten that when you put a cassette on the dashboard of your car in the summertime and it melts yeah the music is so good anymore. they've never, they've never <laughs> had their tape player eat the tape yeah, and then and tape stretching pull it whoa, yeah. whoa. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, well a, a percussionist uh, friend I don't know if you guys know who Morris Palter is but he released his latest seat, his his latest album on LP only and his whole philosophy with that was exactly what Andrew just said is you have to take it out you have to consciously make an effort to listen to it you can't just like oh, let me get this on my phone and push play and like and then I'm gonna drive go and then it. I'm gonna feed the cat and then I'm yeah like it has to be you know it's <laughs> those are the only things I do I just drive and feed the, feed the cat yeah yeah, yeah. Bollocks. Bollocks. Yeah. <laughs> Whipper Creek. Yeah. yeah. Um, There's something about the quality as well. I've got a couple of lecturer friends here at the Adelaide University, and they have some very, very uh, high class stereo systems at home. We're talking upwards of $30,000. Yeah. And they like to do the. The LP to CD yeah. comparison, and then they like to get things like these are you know classical musicians. They like to get Lady Gaga on an MP3 and play it through their yeah. their stereo system. And listen to how bad it is. It gets a bit like dot matrixy yeah. Yeah. on it's like a big Game Boy. You mean the difference between the uh, analog and digital yeah. audio? Uh, but you but you need like he's, you need like an ultra system to hear the difference. Because I, I got to admit, yeah, when I rip a, a tune to this quality MP3 or that quality MP3, I can kind of hear. Yeah, it sounds different, but I don't really not enough for me to pick a preference. I can hear a difference, but it's so subtle. But on like a really nice system, you probably could. Like Dave Pope's, uh, yeah. <laughs> our yeah. colleague has sort of a, a stereo that you're talking about, just yeah. like this ridiculous, awesome home stereo. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, let's see, going down the list. So, will Nyko release another CD anytime soon? We just released a, uh, a new song called um, Goodbye mm. about a month ago. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, you can you can check that out. But yeah, I, I think it. I always love. I loved going into the studio. We actually recorded with a guy named Steve Albini, who recorded uh, Nirvana, uh, one of one of their albums, Nevermind. And he was sort of touted after that record as being like one of the best analog producers. And his studio in Chicago was to two-inch tape. And so lots of people believe that when you're recording analog, uh, the sound quality is way better when you're recording drums and bass. Mm -hmm. And I think the low frequencies are picked up better by two-inch tape than if you're recording to Pro Tools in digital. There's also the aspect, and this is kind of what you're talking about, audiophiles know this, digital is basically a number, is, is signals, zeros and ones. And so in between those zeros and ones, there's there's like space and, and the way you can, one of the ways you can compare it is like the difference between a, a, a light bulb and a fluorescent light, you know, that you'd see in schools. That flat, it's flashing like thousands of times per second. You don't necessarily notice it, but people talk about getting out of school where there's fluorescent lights and at the end of the day they're just wiped out. Same thing is true with digital sound that, adult, and I think it's one of the reasons why people like vinyl is because it's softer on the ears. It's the same as that incandescent bulb. Um, 
And my point there is we recorded with this guy who specializes in that, and you can you can hear the difference in in that sound. I love that experience of recording in the studio and making a whole record. So we recorded you know ten songs, starting with drums and bass, and then and then piled on that. So yeah, I, I intend to get back to that. But I think that the music that I'm writing now is is different, and uh, yeah, I've, I've definitely I'm more enthused about writing for percussion and then other voices with that, chamber music, so I've, I've started to delve into that a bit more. How's being a frontman in a rock band affected, you know, the class you gave the other day? Because I, I think of them as like the extreme difference, like I feel so free, because I used to play in bands, cover band, ska band, uh, punk band, and I loved it, I mean I love playing drums, so I really do, but I feel like, yeah, you just need to know the tunes and then you just play, and you know, it's it's very free, but I feel like when you're doing uh, you know, training for the audition, you, you gotta you gotta really be the extreme opposite. I mean, you gotta yeah. really have this very regimented, planned, refined thing. Yeah. So I don't know. I, how does when I first started when I first started uh, singing in the band, I was so concerned about having good intonation and having it be accurate, and then I I, I learned pretty quickly that most audiences could really give a hoot. What, what's, what's a good expression for that in, in Aussie? If you Crikey. Just, you couldn't yeah. give a toss. You couldn't give a toss. <laughs> yeah, couldn't give yeah. a toss. They couldn't yeah. give a toss right. Right. about, about the robotics. Rude. Yeah, about, about <laughs> the intonation. I mean, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't matter to most audiences. And you listen to, you listen to great rock bands, generally it's not about intonation or precision. It's about the flavor. It's about, it's about the energy. It's about the feel. It's got to be Ridgy Ditch. It's got to be Ridgy Ditch. <laughs> it's got to be genuine and too. It's got to be Ridgy Digi. Ridgy Digi. Is that how you say that? True Blue. True no. Blue. <laughs> Ridgy Digi. Yeah. So so anyway, I'd, I'd say that more and more, and, and I relate this to you know playing, giving a performance, whether it's like a rock band or just being a soloist or being a percussionist, it's about projecting the right energy to the music, and 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 have that come across and have that be a visceral component of performing. So I'd say, you know, in that way it's changed and it's affected how I perform, you know, percussion and, yeah. and teach it to some extent too. Yeah. Well, I think that's really great for a, a big segment. Uh, I think we'll take a quick time out and uh, try to get some of the, the students up here to uh, ask a few questions. So uh, time out, I guess. Yeah. Is there